so welcome to another video from the playersaid.com. My name's Alexander, and today we're doing another from cover to cover episode. You can see I'm here at the new table. I've got the lid off because we've got some games set up inside. So it feels like I'm kind of leaning over a little bit. <laughs> it's just, we're getting used to the new space. Uh, this definitely um, poses some interesting challenges. Uh, but uh, today we're taking a look at a book called The Death of Napoleon by Simon Lees. At least I think it's pronounced Lees, it could be Lays, uh, but we're going to say Lees, L-E-Y-S, just for the sake of convenience. Um, this is, uh, gosh, this is a more recent book compared to some of the other ones that I've read. I think the original publication was back in, so it's from 1986, this was translated into English um, um, back in 91. This particular edition from New York Book Review is from like 2006, I think. Um, but I stumbled across this book f from, oh gosh, I don't even remember where, but I saw someone had mentioned it in a post on the internet. And I, th th it sounded very, very, very interesting. And so I picked it up, it's a very short, it's effectively a novella, um, like it's 130 pages, I think, uh, and it's very, there's a lot of margin space. So it's a very quick read, about two days. I'm not like a massive hardcore reader, but it's very quick to read. Uh, but let's talk about what this is. Uh, so this is a book uh, of a, a, a piece of alternate history, uh, but it is literary historical fiction. So um, Napoleon in this, um, he escapes uh, from his, his kind of final exile uh, after the end of the Hundred Days campaign. Uh, and, you know, he, he's exiled out on his island prison. Um, he escapes from that and he's kind of whisked away by kind of this secret network of like, uh, you know, unseen benefactors, so to speak. Uh, and it is uh, his journey as effectively an unknown man, uh, re kind of retreading some of his last days and what post napoleonic France looks like. Uh, and, and, and a part of me was like, is this a... F it, before I read it, it was like, it sounds a little bit farcical, it sounds kind of a bit crazy and zany, but uh, what it really ends up being is that it is a very, um, whilst short, a really nice, short, kind of rich exploration of f themes like fate and destiny and death and glory uh, and and what it is to kind of outgrow your reputation or conversely when your reputation outgrows you um, there are themes of um, memory, of loss, um, of uh, all sorts of things in here and it is just a fascinating little book. Um, I haven't had this much fun with a book in a while even though it's not like a comedy it, it was a really enjoyable thing to read. There are moments of it that are uh, stunningly funny, um, and I don't want to spoil those for you, but, yeah. He goes back, he, like, it's on the back of the book, but, basically, like, Napoleon is, like, traveling by sea, and then he gets diverted, and he ends up, like, taking a detour to visit the battlefield of Waterloo. And... It is such a, a, a wonderful um, piece in the book. It, it, it's, it's got some great characters and some great, very background characters, but what they represent uh, is wonderful. There's really great funny moments of it. There are some moments that are truly tragic and horrifying though. Uh, and, and the way that the book kind of puts some of those in, in such a short space, is really quite masterful. Um, and I think that's one of the things I really enjoyed about, is how much they pack into this without it feeling um, kind of fabricated um, in, in, any, in any way. Like, the story itself is very natural, and the things that happen 
um, are reflections of history, <laughs> but on a very small and micro scale. And being able to compare and contrast the two of those about real events that actually happened, even going back to things like the French Revolution and the small little meetings that are had, uh, the covert uh, nature of some of the things that have to happen in the book, the, you know, different uh, betrayals or loyalties, identities, things like that that go on. On a very small scale in here are wonderful. There's, there's parts where Napoleon tries to kind of, well, he like takes control of a failing business. And the business itself is, again, it's like a farce, but it's meant to be. To kind of, <laughs> but he treats it like he would have done an old battlefield and his command and how he goes about doing these things. And th that, that scene o over candlelit maps of the distribution of pumpkins and squashes is just, it's stunning. It's, it's, it's a wonderful piece of literature. Um, but at the same time, uh, you get these like really wonderful moments in it, but at the same time, there are um, some really very serious and quite heavy moments and some heavy themes in it. Uh, it's called The Death of Napoleon for a Reason. Uh, spoiler alert, he dies at the end. Uh, <laughs> he's dead. I don't know if you knew that. He's already dead. Uh, he dies at the end of the book. Uh, but also, there is, well, we're going to get into spoilers. If you don't want spoilers, turn off the video, you know? <laughs> but uh, he, th there's a part where, like, his body double, <laughs> who took his place in prison in exile, died prematurely. And he's, like, <laughs> he's, like, frustrated that that guy died because now everyone thinks Napoleon's dead instead of in exile. So his glorious return can't happen because they think he's all dead and they all kind of give up on the Napoleonic ideas. And they give, and it's like, and then there's, there are these wrestling moments internally with him about his identity and who he was and who he is now and how those are not the same things that really are, they make it so much more than kind of a wistful um, reflective novel or novella, there's, there's some really great meat in this about kind of the human condition and the human identity and what it is to um, have experiences kind of outside of what your life was historically. It's very interesting uh, how they kind of cross some of those things. Uh, so I cannot recommend this highly enough. It's absolutely wonderful. But uh, if you want to read this, um, I, I, like I said, very highly recommend it, but if you find yourself reading something like this, what, what have we got some for some war games? Well, we got some very obvious ones, um, at least, and, and again, these are from my collection. I don't have a ton of Napoleonics in my collection. I got some. Uh, I would like to do more over the course of time. Some of them are very big, some of them are very complex, and we just, you know, I can only have so many games, and we just haven't got there yet. But I, I, I enjoy Napoleonics, I think it's fascinating, I know, enough about it where I'm interested in the topic, you know, there's real experts out there, but like my very cursory passing knowledge of some of the broader strokes of um, the Napoleonic Wars lead me to want to know more about it, if that makes sense. So the, one of the early set pieces in the book is him visiting the Battle of Waterloo, at least the fields and the hills and uh, the, the, the churches and the farms and all that. So. Let's talk about what I have for a Waterloo game. I don't have a ton of them, but I have some. Uh, so, first off, we have um, from C3I. Uh, this is from issue 33, and this is the, the little box that they were doing for a while. Um, so, it's Waterloo Campaign 1815 uh, from Mark Herman. This uses the Gettysburg system, uh, but it's a little bit of a higher level and it's a bit bigger, it's a full map instead of a half map, um, and, and it's the Waterloo campaign, but you was in a magazine. Trying to get a hold of some of these old C3Is can be difficult, but there was a time where GMT, I don't know if they still do these, they probably do, but it's this little cardboard, almost like a pizza box, that you can put the magazine and the counter sheets and the game all in it, and then they, were, they gave, um, they gave the cool stickers, because this is just a white piece of cardboard, basically. 
Um, it's all pre-cut, but they gave the little stickers and they have them on the edge, which I really appreciate. So this sits on my shelf, squeezed in a tiny little space. Um, really fun system, um, not a complex system, very low counter density, it's a light game. Um, this one takes a bit longer than Gettysburg does. Gettysburg is like a 30 minute game. This one's more like 60 to 90 minutes. Um, but uh, the system's really easy to learn. You're gonna play the Waterloo campaign uh, and it's a really fun, it's a beautiful looking game as well. And it comes from a magazine. So uh, there is a boxed version of this. Oh, am I lying? I feel like there was a boxed version of this very recently. Um, I don't have it, I didn't get it, don't need it because I have this version of it, but uh, it's, a, it's a light game. If you haven't ever done a Napoleonics, they're really easy to learn. This could be a great place to start for you. Uh, we also have um, Commands and Colors Napoleonics. This is kind of an obvious choice here. Commands and Colors Napoleonics is a favorite uh, over here at the Player's Aid. This is a game that I wish I had more time to play, honestly. Um, We've played it a few times. I absolutely love it. Um, it really works well. Um, the Napoleonic era fits well with the Commands and Colors system, right? You're still in that kind of lines of battle types, types of um, thinking and types of strategy that was going on. Um, but uh, this has so much in it. There is a Waterloo um, scenario in it. Um, if you want to get the commanders and the epic expansion. I've seen people doing like epic versions of Waterloo with multiple maps and you can get really big, but um, they have a ton of battles in this. And there's also, I don't, you can see right here, I have, I have three of the expansions. I have all of the expansions, but I condensed them all down into fewer boxes just because it was taking up so much space. So I think I got rid of one of the boxes recently because it was empty. Uh, but this is also, again, um, it's one of the more complex of the commands and color systems, but it's also commands and colors. It's not that complicated, right? This is an easy system to learn. Anyone can pick it up. But, you know, compared to something like Memoir 44 or even Commands and Colors Ancients, this has a little bit more um, detail in things like the, uh, the combat matrices, and all the different units, unit types, and all of their kind of statistics. There's a big trifold that covers all of that just for the base game, and each of the expansions has them. So there's a bit more detail in all of that. I think that is a credit to the system rather than a detraction. Uh, but you also get a ton in, in here. Like this is chock-a-block, and it's wonderful. Uh, that's a really good game for, you know, you play it, you switch sides, play it again, you've had a great night, basically. It's, it's a, they're not long games, uh, particularly. Uh, next up, I have Napoleon Returns, 1815. Um, this is a very light game um, from Worthington. And we played this a couple years ago. This came out in 2019. There's a full video review of this on our channel. Um, and this was a really interesting game. Um, it, it, you have like a few little wooden blocks that represent uh, different commanders and different core and formations. And it's this little bit of a cat and mouse game that you've got going on. And then effectively what's gonna happen is you're gonna fight maybe a skirmish or two because this is the whole kind of 100 days campaign, I think is what it's called. Um, but uh, you, you fight the, a, a significant portion of the campaign on this little point to point movement map you'll do maybe like a skirmish or two, and then, you, you know, if the cat jumps on the mouse, you'll then fight the Battle of Waterloo. It might not be in Waterloo, but you will fight that big, seminal, conclusive and decisive battle. And that battle is really, really fun to play out. Because you have all your different units, and you have all their different strengths uh, and, uh, and fatigues and things like that. But the combat system in this is a, is a competitive um, card little system. So you, you're almost playing like a down in flames type game. You get into the combat and then I'm gonna do an attack. So I'm gonna do like a charge on the flanks and you have to counter that. And the card says what you can counter it with. You can counter it with like a wheel maneuver. So you counter it with a wheel maneuver and then I'm gonna play something else and they have to counter that. And you go back and forth with those cards and then eventually 
some, you know, you're going to inflict hits and you're going to inflict hits and that's going to go to another round. Um, and, and that's what the game is. It's, it's not a big, complex or serious game. Um, it takes, gosh, um, less than two hours to play. I mean, I want to say we played it in an hour and a half. Um, this is the kind of game that you're going to sit down and play with, like, your dad or your uncle at, like, a holiday gathering, right? Um, this is a, a really nice game for a very casual occasion. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, a lot of Worthington's games kind of fit that bill where they are eminently playable and the complexity level as well as the play times, neither of them are scary and as such they're a really great introduction to kind of historical gaming or war gaming. So Napoleon Returns is really good, uh, really good option for that. And finally we're going to talk about a couple games that I have not played. Um, one of them is uh, Fallen Eagles 2, uh, Waterloo 1815. Um, I'm from Hexasim. I very recently purchased this game. Um, it has stunning components in it. Uh, and I bought this because I was looking for um, a Napoleonic system that wasn't super mega complicated, because there are some very complicated systems out there, um, but that also um, was reasonably modern, had top tier modern components, because there's plenty of old games out there, and it's like, come on, we can do better than that, so what have we got that's new? Then there are new and modern games out there that do some of these old uh, battles. Um, and a number of... Uh, a number of French people, um, who, who Hexum's French company, if you didn't know, um, recommended this, and they and there was some very interesting discussions online after I asked about what systems and what different things do and what kind of showed up. And Waterloo, um, 1850, Fallen Eagles 2 was kind of a big one. It is stunning to look at. I haven't played it, but this is a system that at some point I will learn, I will teach myself, because there's some smaller scenarios that I could probably do solitaire, and then we'll play together uh, on kind of the larger map. But I'm very excited and very interested to play this one, that's for sure. And if it's really good, well, guess what? There's four or five others in this series as well, and that kind of opens that door for me as well. Uh, and lastly, we have kind of the <laughs> this granddad of a game. It is absolutely massive. We have uh, Mark McLaughlin's War and Peace. And this is the... I want to say this might be the fourth edition. This has gone through a number of different editions. This is the One Small Step edition. Um, so it's either the fourth or the fifth. I want to say this is the fourth, but I don't know that for sure. Uh, this one's from 2020. And this has everything in it. This has two big, massive mounted maps, and this has everything from, like, um, Lisbon in Portugal to Moscow in Russia, and everything in between. Um, so, obviously, this is at a much larger and a much grander scale than all of these other games that we've talked about, most of which are tactical. Um, Napoleon Returns a bit more of, a, of, a, of an operational big campaign game, but uh, this is very much a strategic level game. It's still Hex Encounter, and that was one of the things that was very interesting to me, is, okay, we've got a, a big, grand, strategic Hex Encounter Napoleonics game. It's got the whole of Europe on it. I think that's very interesting. Um, I haven't got a chance to play this, and it's one of those games that famously, like, the campaign is kind of, like, very unwieldy, but the scenarios are very good. Um, so I do intend to, at some point, play this, because I am still, I don't know if I've ever mentioned it on this channel, I am about a thousand pages into War and Peace of 1300. So there will be a video of War and Peace coming out, where I will probably mention this again, but my intention is to have at least dabbled in this by the, by the time I'm done with that book, slash that review at least. Um, but uh, if you want kind of a massive, big, bombastic game, two maps, huge, that there's so, like I can barely keep the box closed because it's two mounted maps, I got counter, one counter tray and a million baggies in here as well, because it's too big for the three trays that are necessary. Um, 
But I'm very excited to play that. There's a, a billion Napoleonics games, um, and some of them are b kind of better than others. Uh, and and there's, there's some that we've had to kind of cycle through the collection because we just couldn't get to them. Um, another one that uh, is uh, Na the Napoleonic 20 series, which I don't even know if you can really get that anymore. Um, it, there might be some secondhand available at places like Noble Knight Games, but the Napoleonic 20 series was from Victory Point Games, and the Napoleonic 20 comes from each side had 20 counters. And it was like, we and we played, um, I'm pretty sure we played Waterloo 20, which was, I had 20 guys, and it was like, here's a bunch of, here's a bunch of British troops, and then here's some, um, here's, here's Blucher's troops that are going to come on on the side, and then here's all the French. Uh, and it's, it, that was a really nice, that was our, I think that was our first ever Napoleonics game. I'm pretty sure there is also a video review for that. Gosh, that's a long time ago. I don't know. If there is, check check it out. <laughs> oh, the the thing that I remember from that game is that the printing is stunning, and it had one of the best play aids of all time. It had so much stuff condensed onto the play aid that you could play from the play aid, and it was really really good. Uh, but that's a really good system where it's hex encounter, but it's still low counter density, and the map is small, and you got like your line of guys and your line of guys, and you've got this you could move but you can't attack and it's like i'm trying to run up and then you get shot and then it's like oh i gotta keep going it, it was a really really neat little system so if you're looking for something like that napoleonic 20 that's a good series if you can find those i have a bunch of others um i have uh, a lot of uh what is it called the uh, vive l'empereur system which is um currently being printed by legion war games um, i have a i have three of those but none of those are particularly relevant to, to, to this book, so I didn't kind of bring those over here. And I, you know, I've gone through a number of grand tactical Napoleonics games that have come in and out uh, of the collection, so I kind of wanted to talk about these ones because he's a bit more focused on the Waterloo, which is a, is a good, that's a real high, like, a significant part of this book. And then like the second half of the book is more about um, uh, Napoleon's uh, dabbling around in Paris, uh, so that there's less kind of revisiting anything else or any direct conflicts wise. It's more about him and his identity crisis, so to speak. Uh, the book I will come back to is saying that it is wonderful. Um, I do appreciate a good, um, really meaty and punchy novella like this to help you maybe get out of a reading slump or to read between two large tomes. Sometimes you want a little bit of literary fiction, and uh, this time it's historical fiction, just to like wet the palate between maybe two large nonfiction books as well. There's, there's plenty of history to read, but I do think that there is a lot of merit in, um, in literature, but that's, you know, that's my personal taste, that's for sure. So, uh, The Death of Napoleon from Simon Lees. I very highly recommend this. Um, it has, um, okay, uh, I will mention it, but uh, there is some very colorful, at times, um, language, because it's set in the 1800s, and, uh, <laughs> Certain people are not treated very well, uh, or they're not treated with much respect, and so there's a couple times where, you know, if that's not your taste, you know, just be prepared. Um, it's not it's not a large part of the book in any meaningful way. It, it, they like they have a nickname for someone, and it is <laughs> not necessarily up to today's very tasteful standards. Uh, indeed, it's quite the opposite. But that's one of these characters, uh, and it's a reflection of the history. I guess. But uh, the book itself is is very wonderful um, and it and it does a lot of what I like in books. I like a book that will explore themes and help to maybe point to things or ask questions or ask you questions that can reveal things about yourself. 
Um, and I like that in games, I like that in books, because I think that different media can help us to, I don't know, consider a wider world outside of ourselves. It does that by posing questions, by asking us and challenging maybe some of our, um, just like, thought patterns or beliefs and things like that. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is going to change your life, but uh, it's still it touches on some of those themes, and that's one of the things that I resonate with when I'm reading books. Um, and so, there's a lot of really great games that I have, but as you can see, a lot of my Napoleonics games are fairly introductory. I think Fallen Eagles is gonna be good, that's kind of a bit of a step up. War and Peace will get there eventually, but I don't have anything like Library of Napoleonic Battles, or Labatai, or, you know, much of that. I did just buy um, Austerlitz from the gamers. That was like 35 bucks from uh, Noble Knight. So at some point I will try that. That's probably a bit further off. Um, but, you know, I've got a lot of these kind of simple introductory Napoleonics games. And at some point I would like to take a plunge into some of those. But we're going to start with Fallen Eagles 2. So you will see more of that on the channel at some point. I can't promise you when that's going to be, uh, but uh, there will be something from that eventually. But uh, either way, I appreciate you very much for tuning in and sticking with me on another of my book rambles. But uh, The Death of Napoleon from Simon Lees, you've you got to check it out. Again, a little, short little punchy read, really, really enjoyable, a great ride, has some great highs and some great lows in it as well. But thank you very much for tuning in. I've been Alexander from ThePlayersAid.com.